afternoon, Twin Cities, up and out of I'm Jack Times like that has been Cruzy. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Welcome to the uh, gubernatorial forum at the Minnesota Public Radio booth at the Minnesota State Fair. Uh, there are half as many people here who came to our show every day this week. Uh, <laughs> but this is not about up and out on the podcast that you can get on iTunes or Google Play delivered right to your smartphone every single morning or afternoon, whatever you'd prefer. Up and Adam Show com. That too. All right. We've gone for this gubernatorial forum of the Republican Party. We've gone in the order that uh, the order that people got in the corn poll competition. So whoever got the most corn, Jeff Johnson sitting here, and then down to go. So Jeff Johnson, Matt Dean, Keith Downey, Dave Osmeck, Philip Parrish, Jeffrey Wharton, Christopher. and Christopher Chamberlain. Christopher. You guys need to switch. Did I get my lit? I, I measured them. I did. You could, you're the last one? You can take last spot. All right. Christopher Chamberlain. And bringing up the rear, Jeffrey Wharton. All right, here's the format. Uh, six questions, and everybody will get a minute and a half to answer them. Uh, don't push me on that. Ben will cut your mic. Be mad at him, not me. And then we've got a three-question lightning round where people will get 10 seconds to answer the question. Uh, most of them are yes or no's. And then a closing statement by each of the candidates, which will be a minute. So, getting my list, starting with Jeff Johnson. Then, Jeff, as soon as I ask it, I will get out of your way. I've got a clock. And Ben's keeping the time. For your opening statement, please tell us what skills or perspectives you offer to the people of Minnesota that make you the best person to govern. Jeff Johnson. Um, thank you. Thanks, Jack and Ben. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Jeff Johnson. So the question is, what is it that sets me apart from a st standpoint of skills and experience? And I would say a couple things. Number one, I've had uh, extensive experience both in government, both at the local and state level, Hennepin County Commissioner and State House, but also during that entire time in the private sector, both as an employee of a small business, a large business, and now the last 15 years as an owner of my own business, which I think is really important in government because we don't have enough of that. I will add to that the one thing that uh, makes me unique in this race is the fact that I ran again in 2014. Frank Sinatra used to say, don't try to hide your scars because they make you who you are. I don't try to hide the f uh, fact that I lost to Mark Dayton in 2014. And in fact, I believe running in 2014 is one of the things that makes me stronger than everyone else in this race because I'm the only one who's been through the fire of a governor's race. I know where I made mistakes and will fix, fix them. And I've proven to you what I can do really, really well. I won huge with independence. I raised more money than Mark Dayton. I got more votes than any other Republican. And in the process, I learned a lesson or two. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff Johnson. Next up, State Representative Matt Dean. Matt, uh, please tell us what skills or perspectives you offer the people of Minnesota that make you the best person to govern. All right, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Happy Labor Day to everybody. And I remember yesterday I talked to a little kid. He was starting kindergarten tomorrow. And when I was a kid... A, kin a kindergartner the next day on Labor Day, I remember one of the first things I can remember about the fair is my dad bought me a little blue felt hat with a big feather that I wore my first day of kindergarten the next day. And on that day, I met my wife, Laura, in that kindergarten. And after we graduated from ninth grade, we've been coming to the fair every year since then. Now, I thought I was really cool in my little blue felt hat with a white feather. I kind of imagined myself like Starsky and Hutch or something, but everybody laughed at me the next day except Laura in kindergarten. So that's why I stuck with her, and I'm glad I did. Uh, the fair is a great place. I've been out here all week having a great time talking to Minnesotans about where we go next. This is what sets me apart from the rest, I think, and it's what I hear every day out here, and I hear it from conservatives, I hear it from Democrats, from liberals and independents. They say, don't tell me who you're going to beat because I know you're good at that stuff. Tell me what you're going to do when you win and be honest about it. I've done that in the legislature. I've done that in my private life, and I'm going to do it here. Uh, it's great to be here. I look forward to the debate ahead. I look forward to the long work ahead uh, towards a victory. When I got here the first day, somebody said, Time. looked at my booth, and they said, Are you Matt Dean? And I said, Yeah. And he said, When can you start? So that's what we're up to. We're going to replace Mark Dayton. Thank you, Matt Dean. Next up, the opening statement. Question is Keith Downey. What sets you, uh, what skills or perspective do you offer the people of Minnesota that make you the best person to govern? 
Well, thanks everybody for being here. And uh, after a week at the fair, listening to the people of Minnesota uh, telling you what they think, and maybe not quite as interested as what I'm going to bring to the table, I've come to the conclusion that there are three questions that we need to be asking. Number one, are you concerned whether your kids are going to stay in Minnesota? Are you concerned that your parents are going to stay in Minnesota? Have you asked yourself whether you can stay in Minnesota? You ask that question of the people at the fair and it hits them. We are in a failure to thrive situation in Minnesota. The same old, same old isn't going to cut it. And I think I'm the only candidate coming to the table this year with more experience in business than in the public sector. And so if you want somebody who has been a business leader, who has been a political reformer, somebody who has been entirely consistent in what they have brought to the table when they were in their public life, then I think I'm your guy. I believe I am the only candidate on this stage who has actually cut their budget, cut their debt, and won elections. We reduced the state party budget by 50%, the debt by over 50%, and we won. We can do this, people. We can stand for the people of Minnesota. We can win in 2018. Thank you, Keith Downey. Shots fired, by the way. And uh, we got a clock right down there, Ben, on his desk. So you can see that so you don't go over time. That's new Senator Dave Osmick. Well, thank you. We have the shot clock now, so we know exactly how much time we have. Um, I'm Senator Dave Osmick. Uh, I want to be governor because I am a fighter, and I want to fight for your values. Uh, your values are fundamentally Minnesota values. They're not Republican values. They're not conservative values. They really are Minnesota values, and we need people that are going to stand up for those values. I grew up in central, south central Minnesota, in a little outside of a little town called Bisky. Came home to my grandparents' farm and stayed there for about the first 18 years of my my life. You learn work ethic. You learn helping your neighbor. You learn those fundamental skills and fundamental benefits or values that make you a good, not just a good person, but also a good candidate. Number one, what am I going to do as governor? Number one, eliminate the MEP Council. End of story. I have submitted the bill. I've submitted it twice now. 241 pages. 241 pages worth of legislation to get rid of the Metropolitan Council. Number two, we will be getting rid of Met, uh, the uh, light rail in Minnesota. No more Southwest and no more Botano. I shocked the folks in the media. There are some here right now. But because uh, I was direct, honest, and said what I was going to do. And that's the one thing you have always seen from me being a city councilman in the city of Mound for 11 years or now in the state senate is what I say is what I do. So thank you for being here. Thank you Dave Osmick. Next up, Philip Parrish. For your opening statement, please tell us what skills or perspectives you offer the people of Minnesota that make you the best person to govern. Minute 30. Thank you. Hi, I'm Philip Parrish. Uh, the best thing you can do to make sure you get all the details, because I'm not going to get it done in a minute, go to parrishformen.com. Parrish, P-A-R-R-I-S-H, the number four, M-N.com. Check it out. Make sure you read all of it, because this is about knowing everything and getting to know all of us, all about us, not just a one-minute blurb, okay? I'm the best candidate because I was the only person when I started researching in December of last year and then January came around and I couldn't find a candidate that was out there telling the truth to Minnesotans. I couldn't find a single one that telling you the truth about security, our freedoms, and what's going to happen to our prosperity. I decided that I had to run. So I could have gone home because of my military experience, 19 year veteran, I specialize in counterterrorism and foreign policy. I could have gone home, just shut the door, lived out my life at home, no big deal. But I can't do that, that's not who I am. I have a lot of respect for these gentlemen. I understand a lot of you have been working really hard and I have a lot of respect for the, those legislators that have been working really hard and doing the right thing. But it's time to stop being polite. We are going to end the Immigration Relocation Program participation. We're going to stop it now. We're going to get rid of the Met Council. We're going to start letting you prosper from your hard labors for your work without having to be bled dry every time you turn around. So I'm Philip Parrish. Please check out the website. Learn more about what's going on, not just a one minute blurb. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip Parrish. It was a minute and a half blurb. Up next, Christopher Chamberlain. What skills and perspectives do you offer the people of Minnesota that make you the best person to govern? One minute, 30 seconds. All right. 
Name is Christopher Chamberlain. Visit my website, Chamberlain4MN, C-H-A-M-B-E-R-L-I-N-F-O-R-M-N. I also have at Real Chamberlain on Twitter. What sets me apart from these other candidates is I've lived a normal life. Unlike a lot of these guys, I've lived on the system. I understand what the corrupt welfare system of our state can do to people. And these guys have had great careers. These guys have been in politics. I'm an outsider. Never held elected office. I'm a normal, everyday guy. What I do believe in is our Constitution. I believe I will back constitutional carry. I will end gun-free zones. We will, as Mr. Paris said, end the Refugee Relocation and Immigration Program. It has put a devastating hole in our state, and we need to plug it. We need to start concentrating on Minnesota families and veterans first. We have too many of them living on our streets, and they have to come first. Secondly, I believe that it's time for us to redesign LGA. It has been corrupted. We need to make sure the funds are going where they are truly needed. I also want to address farmers. A lot of farmers are not getting the help they need. We have regulations that are crushing generation-long farmers in Todd County. The buffer strip has to go. I believe in our nation, and I believe in the freedom of religion. We must stand united as one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris Chamberlain. Bringing up the rear, candidate Jeffrey Wharton. Uh, please tell us what skills and perspectives you offer the people of Minnesota that make you the best person to govern. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. All right. I'm Jeff Wharton, and if you want to know more about me, like these last two gentlemen said, go to Facebook. If you're on Facebook, I know it might sound a little adolescent, but just check out Wharton for Minnesota 2018. You'll see videos. I talk. I, I believe in video more than I do just typing because the, the voice speaks louder than words. Um, for me, I definitely agree with everything that Chris just said. Uh, we do need to get rid of the refugee relocation program. We need to strengthen our security and law enforcement. And me personally, I believe we need to bring back accountability because it's been lacking for far too long. Uh, on another note, uh, the healthcare system as well needs to be redesigned. It needs to be redeveloped and brought back so that the uh, government has no control of it no more. We need to bring it to a, a top carrier that will give us the best price that's going to cover every aspect of uh, medical down the line for everybody. Uh, for me personally, I, I believe what I bring to the table is uh, my own personal life experience, and I'm sure everyone is probably going to leave with that thinking, well, we all have issues, but I, I, I carry with me the things I've learned and the things I hear, and I use them to my best abilities as far as I've gotten in life today. So with that, you know, I gave you the website for Facebook, check me out. God bless you guys, hope you have a great day. All right, you can keep the mic and go grab a seat. We're going to go reverse order now, so you get the next question. Chris, you're, you, grab a seat, Chris. Jeff, wait, no, stay right there. Hang on the mic. Nope, take a seat. There we go. All right, now we're going this way. Are you electable statewide, and what is the strongest evidence of your statewide electability? A uh, minute and a half. As far as statewide electability, um, I've already been told by numerous people that far and in between that I'll even get elected. That doesn't mean I'm going to give up, because that's not in my nature. And you know, the, the long story short, yeah, you just got to keep pushing. I know I'm a rookie. These guys, I, I have the utmost respect for every man up on this stage, and it's inspirational for me because all I keep doing at these these you know these get-togethers is, you know, I'm continuously learning. I'm continuously doing my best to do my homework to, to further educate myself on other aspects of of state you know situations. Um, I'm very sensitive about other situations that I, I want to push for. Um, as far as, like you said, about being elected statewide, it's going to be a hard fight. So, I mean, all I can do is just keep pushing. All right, Jeff Wharton. Uh, next, Christopher Chamber. I got your name wrong. That was the confusion. That's my fault. Uh, minute and a half. Are you electable? That's because you guys got out of order. I had an order down. Uh, are you electable statewide? What is the strongest evidence for your statewide electability? Minute and a half. Don't feel like you, you got to use all the time. All right. Well, electability statewide. Yes, I believe I am electable. I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. Ah, <laughs> sure. Sorry talking. Anyways, yeah, I believe I am electable statewide. Um, people understand where I come from. They understand that I know the common struggle, the common plight 
from people, normal people, everyday Americans, everyday Minnesotans. They understand that I have that view and I'm standing strong with our Constitution. I will align myself with the Constitution. I have a vow on the back of my card. I will not abet or support any action, bill, or amendment that does not align with the Constitution. We have to support our Constitution first and foremost. Thank you. Next up, Philip Parrish. Are you electable statewide? What is the strongest evidence for your statewide electability? Bit and a half. Yes, I am electable statewide. The strongest evidence comes from the interactions with, I would say, I, I would have to count uh, very diligently uh, the number of students as a teacher for over 13 years and K-12 teacher. I have had uh, 20 to 30, 35, 40 students at a time in my classrooms from K through 12 for over 13 years. Do the math. I have teachers, former students, former students and their children who walk up to me and say, hey, Mr. Parrish, you were my teacher. And hey, what? guess what? My kids, they're in elect, they're, uh, voting age now. So it's really a wonderful experience to be across Minnesota and see all the wonderful faces that I've seen over the years. The military career has served me well, and I say that with a, a great deal of humility because that uh, service is about service. It's not to... to um, overemphasize the piece and, and uh, create some kind of a false perception of what I'm doing there. It is about service and those military family members throughout the state who have, are spread far and wide from border to border. The number of them that have reached out to me and said, you know what, Phil, you got to do this. Get up there. Keep telling the truth. Um, this is real and, and we can get this done and we're going to win. Team Parish is growing really, really fast. So shout out to Team Parish. All right, thanks, Philip Parrish. Uh, Senator Dave Osmek, are you electable statewide? What is the strongest evidence of your statewide electability? Well, let me let me make one prediction. You're going to hear yes from everybody up here, so let's start with that. And the answer is absolutely yes. I have won three different campaigns for city council. I also ran uh, and won the most contended or contentious uh, primary in 2012. I won by 107 votes against a money machine that ran against a conservative conservative values individual that fought for those conservative values. Uh, so am I electable? Absolutely. Uh, I have those skills and I, I currently work in the Senate making sure that we are the most conservative Senate that we can be. In the, uh, in the legislature it's very difficult from time to time to be able to get things done, but I have gotten things done and one thing I'm the most proud of is that we are getting out of the biomass mandate that we got into 10 years ago. We're going to save three quarters of a billion dollars over the next 10 years out of your wallets. We're going to save you money. We need people who will take government, flip it upside down. Washington DC is, we're seeing that happen in Washington DC. We need to do that here in St. Paul. Am I electable? Absolutely. Thank you, Dave Osmek. Keith Downey, are you electable statewide? What is the strongest evidence for your statewide electability? Yes, sir. And I'm going to give a political answer and a personal answer. If you want to win a statewide race in Minnesota, you got to find a way to reach the people of greater Minnesota, the exurbs, the suburbs, and the urban core. And if you can't do that, it's really tough to make the math work. And so anybody running here thinking that they're going to win because they hate the Met Council and Southwest Light Rail the most, or they're the most socially conservative, or they're this or they're that, you have to be able to appeal across this state. I think I appeal fundamentally to the people of greater Minnesota. I have the business experience to appeal to people in the suburbs. I'm going to fight for conservative, limited government principles to appeal to people in the exurbs. And I spent the last four years after moving the state party office into Minneapolis building relationships with those urban core minority groups and others that will give us a chance to get a higher vote total in the metro, in the urban core. But here's the personal reason. And anybody who stood on the street out here for the last 12 days and listened to the people of Minnesota, they know that the energy from the last election that spurred Donald Trump to victory is alive and well, and if anything else, it has intensified. They are looking for an outsider. They are looking for somebody who will actually go in and change the status quo. They're looking for somebody who will fight for them, and that's our opportunity on the Republican side. We have a chance over the next nine months before our endorsement Time. to get out and present that message to Minnesota, and if we do, we're going to have success in 2018. Thank you, Keith Downey. State Representative Matt Dino, you elected statewide. What is the strongest evidence for your statewide electability? 
As a fifth generation Minnesotan, I can tell you that this state is hungry for leadership. They want to get behind a leader and they want our state to move forward, not as a Republican state or a Democrat state or a purple state, but they want our state to move ahead. They're tired of a lack of leadership from the governor. They're tired of, I'm smart, you're dumb, I'm good, you're bad, I'm gonna blame you. And where I hear that most from is from conservatives. Conservatives are telling me, show me what you're gonna do, tell me what you're gonna do, and then go do it. I've done that in the legislature. I've been able to do things with a governor from a Republican party, Governor Pawlenty. I've also been able to do things like kill the sick tax with a governor from the other side of the party, from Governor Dayton. I've been able to do that from a from a district that doesn't always vote Republican. I voted, I voted uh, l consistently conservative, and in the last election, people told me, you are gonna get killed because Donald Trump is gonna die in the suburbs. You just run away, run away, run away from your party. I ran on my convictions. I didn't want to run away from them. Yes, I ran 11 points ahead of the president on the last ballot, but it wasn't because I ran away from my convictions or my party. I think it was because I ran on my convictions and with my party and with every other Republican on the ballot and did so with a lot of hard work and a lot of shoe leather, and that's how we're gonna win next time. Thank you, Representative Dean. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, are you electable statewide? What is the strongest evidence for your statewide electability? Well, the answer is yes, and I'll give you two reasons. Number one, I'm, I'm the most geographically balanced of any of the candidates up here. My wife and I were born and raised in northwestern Minnesota, essentially spent half of our lives in rural Minnesota. We've been in the suburbs for the second half of our lives, and the last eight years I've spent every week in Minneapolis dealing with issues that affect the urban core. And I agree with Keith that if you can't win in every area, you're not going to win. More importantly, though, I was able to do in the last election what is the hardest thing for Rep statewide Republicans to do in this state, and that's win independence. And I won independence as a conservative, with a conservative message. I ran against an uh, extremely popular incumbent with a huge outside money advantage, and I beat him with independence by 10%, and I tied with independent women which is unheard of for a conservative Republican. So what I was able to prove is that I can take our conservative message and share it in a way that appeals to more than just Republicans, and that's the key to winning in 2018. All right, thank you, Commissioner Jeff Johnson. Hang on to that mic. We're starting with you, and we head back the other way. What should Minnesota do to promote economic growth? Number one, we need to cut taxes and eliminate regulations. We don't compete with the states that surround us. I also, however, don't believe that Mark Dayton's strategy for economic development makes any sense for us. And I think there's some differences up here on this particular set of issues. Mark Dayton's strategy has been, let's have a, a, a business environment that is very unfriendly to entrepreneurs, both from a tax and regulatory perspective, but let's try to lure a big company here every once in a while by giving them subsidies that no other business gets. That, frankly, has tended to also, at times, been a Republican strategy, and it's the wrong strategy. We should lower, lower taxes for everyone, big or small, and we should change the regulatory attitude in government from that of controlling and directing and punishing to that of actually serving the people who pay our salaries and helping businesses to succeed. If they refuse to follow the rules, fine then you find them or you jail them or you do whatever you need to do. But government's job should not be to control and punish. It should be to serve. And I think that is the, I think that's the most important piece along with taxes and regulations of making sure that Minnesota is finally competitive with the states that surround us. All right, thank you, Jeff. Representative Matt Dean, what should Minnesota do to promote economic growth? A hundred years ago, all of the wealth in the state of Minnesota came from harvesting stuff, making stuff, and healing people. Today, all of the wealth in the state of Minnesota comes from harvesting stuff, making stuff, and healing people. And we've got a governor right now that has basically declared war on all three. So if you're harvesting timber, agriculture, or minerals, if you're manufacturing, or if you're in medicine, what are you thinking about? You're thinking the government is there to get in my way and to try to put me out of business. And is it any wonder that North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, the states that are around us that are really focusing on jobs are doing better than us. They're attracting those jobs and that growth. What's different about there than here? It's not our workforce. We've got a great workforce. It's about the climate. 
and it's about the intentions and little things are big things and when you can say to a farmer or you can say to a miner we're gonna make things a little easier for you next year instead of a little harder you're gonna make some headway and when I was up on the iron range I the woman up there is two kids seventy two thousand dollars a year in the mine she's now making nineteen thousand dollars a year with two jobs and no health care you're gonna tell me that those two jobs are the same they're not we need middle-class Minnesota families to work again we gotta make work work for Minnesota families we are the party of the middle class and we're gonna make that that case wall-to-wall -wall, border to border and Time. I can't wait to take that on the road thank you Matt uh, Keith Downey what should Minnesota do to promote economic growth well thank you and a couple of things uh, Matt has it partially right, but the legacy strength of Minnesota's economy is in its diversity. And he didn't mention the massive retail sector, the financial services sector, the construction sector, the professional services sectors that we have. At one point in time, Minnesota had one of the most diverse and dynamic economies, and we've squandered it under Mark Dayton's policies for the last eight years, to the point where venture capital investment and other investment in job growth has effectively dwindled and dried up. And the solution is actually quite obvious, and Jeff is exactly right. You gotta cut regulation, and if you have to cut taxes. And everybody who says that, I think, doesn't really have a clue that on the other side of that coin is you gotta cut state spending. You cannot offer tax relief unless you cut state spending. And unfortunately, the last couple of years haven't been any better than the previous four under a Democrat regime entirely. We grew the state budget in the last 10 years 50%. Just this last year, a 9% increase. 9%. And that's what our guys went along with. We had a $3.6 billion surplus after the Democrats' tax increase of five years ago. $3.6 billion, and the state kept 80% of it for themselves. We wasted a billion dollars on MNSURE. We just bailed it out with another billion dollars. If you really want to cut taxes, you got to get at the spending. I proposed the bill five Time. years ago. I'm committing to it again to reduce state spending by 15%. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Senator Osmick, what should Minnesota do to promote economic growth? Well, I think well, I think I sort of started go. I think I sort of started to go into this last the, with the last answer that I gave you. Think about saving three quarters of a billion dollars over the next ten years, keeping it in your wallet, and it's all because of a government mandate. That's just one thing that we did. We have other mandates that have been hinted upon here, but I'll give you another example. We have some of the most restrictive truck weight requirements in the entire for, for surrounding states. Surrounding states can put a whole bunch more uh, product onto trucks, and it doesn't hurt their roads. Matter of fact, we have worse roads than the states surrounding us that allow larger truck weights. This is what happens when you can actually do that. By changing that rule, you actually get to be able to put more concrete into trucks. If we had done this with lower, or higher truck weights, when we tore down the Metrodome, which I wouldn't have voted for, but if we had torn down the Metrodome and used the higher truck weights, we would have saved millions of dollars, millions of dollars, with stupid governmental regulations that hurt who? You. Because you don't know where they are. We do, because we're down in the gutter with and trying to fight for those values to get rid of them. And you need a fighter that knows where to kick over that, that, that rock and find out the savings to make it go back to your pocket. Dave? There you go. Uh, what should Minnesota do to promote economic growth, Philip Parrish? Number one, we're going to end our participation in the immigration relocation program. The exploitation that you are feeling in your pockets about paying for programs that none of you voted for, none of you signed up for, and none of you knew that your dollars are being commandeered by the federal government for, are going to end. Along with a list and lists and lists of funded programs for illicit activities in this state that no one up here is talking about. No one except me. No, uh, no matter where you are, no matter where you try to hide, no matter what false shell company you try to put up and prop up on the internet or prop up on a piece of paper or with our federal government, which Lori Swanson, shame on you, you're not taking this stuff on. We can end a lot of our problems with money by just exposing the fact of how corrupt and exploited, all exploited our family and friends have been 
and how corrupt in, the internal workings of those programs are. Number two, we're going to just take a step back and think about the word scheme. Think about a tax scheme. Think about the word scheme. How closely does that word align with the word scam? We're going to expose every scam within our government. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Chamberlain, what should Minnesota do to promote economic growth? Number one, I want to freeze spending for two years. Dead on freeze it. We need to stop government spending, period, for two years and identify what programs need to stay and what ones got to get booed. There is too much spending in our government. Uh, Ronald Reagan said it best, too. It's not the government's job to tell you what to do, but yours to tell it what to do. Time for us to tell the government, stop spending my money. It belongs in my pocketbook, not yours. Um, reducing regulations on businesses and families, taxes, we have to do that. We have to protect entrepreneurship. We have to help it grow. These people want the American dream and we can give it to them. We can help them succeed on all levels of business, whether it's a mom and pop shop or new birthing corporation. We need to stand together and help these businesses succeed. Thank, thank you, Christopher. Uh, Jeffrey Wharton, what should Minnesota do to promote economic growth? Well, this guy right here pretty much took the words out of my mouth. Now my jaw hurts. Thanks. Um, uh, me personally, you know, again, you know, these gentlemen up here have a long, extensive line in, in the field of, of politics and you know, business. Um, I, I'm pretty much a loner in, in Southwest Minnesota that's um, building on my own, uh, my own reform as far as how I do things. I, you know. Many good things have been said about it up here already. We do need to lower the taxes. We do need to build reform. Uh, as far as that, the, the best way I see it, and I'm sure a lot of a lot of people are gonna hate me when I say it. I look at other states that have uh, potentially legalized, you know, who, who dipped into legalization, and they've turned around their legalization of marijuana. And I, I look at the the prosperity of these other states who have built on that on that backbone of that and they haven't abused it so I think if we if we took a look at that we would be able to actually uh, utilize you know the hemp product for more than just medicinal we could use it for housing uh, and other allocations uh, and we're gonna lower taxes doing it because with that alone we're gonna be able to build on the economics of the state all right hang on to the mic uh, you get the uh, the next question first what will the size of your first proposed two-year general fund budget be? Uh, and explain your reasoning. Well, wow. that's the first time I've been put on a spot that bad in a long time. Um, yeah, I really don't... Uh, I, I need to uh, keep working on that. That's the one thing I need to work on, to do more number crunching and do more figuring myself on where I want to go with it and how I want to you know, deliver it to the people of Minnesota. So it's not that I don't know, it's just I haven't fully developed my own idea yet. So in time I will deliver that on my page or I'll get with anybody who would like to talk about it in the near future. And once I have a developed plan, then I'd be more than happy to, to uh, give it. All right, thank you. Uh, Christopher Chamberlain, uh, what, will the si what will be the size of your first proposed two-year general fund budget? Explain your reasoning. Frozen. Frozen, like I said, freezing government spending. We'll stop it, take a better look at the uh, spending levels that the uh, government is doing, and adjust it appropriately. I can't give you a figure. You want numbers? We don't have numbers. We have to propose it. We have to look. When we freeze the budget for the two years, we will actually look at saving a lot of money because we're going to stop excessive spending. All right. Thank you. Philip Parrish, what will be the size of your first proposed two-year general fund budget? Explain your reasoning. One-third of the cost of the per current budget. One-third of the government will be gone. Sorry, the math doesn't work out there. If one third's gone, that leaves two thirds. Yeah. So which is it? One third or two thirds? One third of the current budget. Okay. Will be gone. Okay. Real. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Osnick, what will be the size of your first proposed two-year general fund budget? Explain your reasoning and math. I would start at $42 billion and start working down. And the reason I say that is that is going back into the previous biennium that makes reasonable reductions across the board. I think what uh, what my colleague here just said was 30 million, or I'm sorry, 30 billion, uh, because we're currently about 45-ish, uh, depending on the day of the week, it seems like. Uh, but the, the first thing you have to do, too, when you're saying, I'm going to start at 42, is you have to get legislative leaders together in January, and instead of waiting to the last second, set the first number. Set the first number at 42 million billion, and I will say I will only go down from that number if you don't if you keep arguing with me. So you have to start at the number and build out your budget as opposed to what we've been doing lately, which is creating a gangs rush at the very end of legislative session, and then we're passing crap in the middle of the night, which is completely wrong. And I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues will agree with this. We should be getting these bills done with two weeks left in session as opposed to waiting until two minutes before the end of session. Thank you, Senator Ozma. Keith Downey, what would be the size of your first proposed two-year general fund budget? Explain your reasoning. Well, uh, Senator Osmick is right. The right number in the end is $42 billion. If you want to reduce state spending by 15% uh, over four years in my first term, which I've committed to do, uh, that gets you halfway there. However, if we have a Republican legislature that is going to again propose an 8% and a 9% increase, I might have to start out lower if the strategy down there is to negotiate halfway and get to the middle. But let me tell you that no answer up here has any credibility, zero credibility, unless you actually have the proposals that get you there. You can't just put a number out there. You know what they're gonna do to you? They're gonna tear you to shreds. I have a proposal from five years ago that would uh, cut the state budget 15% over five years, and it consisted of 20 specific proposals. Some of those proposals actually require a little bit of investment. If you want to consolidate agencies, if you want to uh, consolidate things between the county and the state, you have to have concrete proposals or your number doesn't mean anything in the negotiations and you're going to be laughed out of St. Paul by the lobbyists and the press and by the Democrats and even the guys in our own party. So you better go in strong and you better have the right number and you better have the meat on the bone to defend what you're going to propose. Thank you, Keith Downey. Uh, Representative Matt Dean, what will be the size of your first proposed two-year general fund budget? Explain your reasoning. Thanks. Just for, for folks to get a little bit of a reference out there, in 2013, in July, our budget at the state level was about $35 billion. Today, Governor Mark Dayton signed into law a, a bill that puts us at 46 point something billion dollars, growing to 47 and a half. So, if you look at that, you'd say that's bad, but it's actually worse than that. We've spent down all of our health care access fund, we've drained all of the cupboards, we've gone through the couch cushions, we've spent all that money, and we put it on escalators that tend to grow over time. So I can tell you this, that we are going to be in the soup if we just continue to say, we're just going to do what we did before, and we're going to meddle around at the edges about if we have little inflation or plus or minus inflation, where we're going to be. I can tell you the most important thing is to have an honest discussion with the legislature immediately. One of the first things I'm going to do if I'm governor is to call Keith Downey, because <laughs> Keith is actually somebody who is really committed to this in the past in the legislature too. And guys like Keith and Jeff and others are going to have to be part of this equation immediately. And I can tell you this, this is one thing that when I talk to the legislature, whether it's a Republican legislature or a Democrat legislature, they will know if they send me a budget that is over, I will veto a Republican legislature's budget Time. if it's a bad budget. I'm willing to veto a Republican budget. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Commissioner Jeff Johnson, what will be the size of your first proposed two-year general fund budget? Explain your reason. I'm not going to give you a number, but I will, I will make a commitment that it will be smaller than the current one, and I've actually made that commitment to the media on the record. I won't sign a budget in 2019 that is bigger than the 27 2017-2018 uh, budget, even with an all-Republican government. But let me, let me tell you why we've gotten here. There's actually a few reasons, but part of it is just the horrible process and what we are now accepting as good government. 
it's apparently acceptable now to have a literally three or four people go into a back room a week before the end of session and come up with a deal and then have hundreds of pages of bills sit it on the desk in front of bleary-eyed legislators who can't read it. They've never, they don't know what's in it. That's why government is growing. I will tell you another reason that it's growing. It's because we're using omnibus bills in a way that is unconstitutional. I will veto any omnibus bill that doesn't meet the constitutional requirements of a single subject. The, the courts have been unwilling to do that. I will as governor, and I don't care if I like what's in the bill or not, but the problem is we've gotten to a point where it is now apparently acceptable to throw everything in to an omnibus bill that would not pass on its own, and Republicans and Democrats are as guilty of this as anyone else. They're, they're throwing everything into one bill because it wouldn't pass on its own. That is one of the reasons that that spending is completely out of control the past two decades. All right, thanks, Jeff. You got the next question as well. We'll work back the other way. Who was the best Minnesota governor? What was his best accomplishment? Why do and I have none to of go this, first? None of, none of this, this, this future, it'll be me someday, none of that. <laughs> I'm not going to give you one, I'm sorry, but I will give you a, a, a combo because I, I think it's hard to say one. Uh, I served under both Tim Pawlenty and Jesse Ventura, and I think there were, there were parts of both of them that were good. I think, at, at least for a period of time, Tim Pawlenty worked really hard to control the budget. I don't think we ever actually made it smaller, unfortunately, but I think he did a good job of that. I also think, frankly, Jesse Ventura had a lot of good what I would call libertarian-leaning ideas about the role of government in our life, which I happen to think is the biggest problem in government right now, this mantra that we know best how you should spend your money and live your life. It's rampant, and that needs to change. Let me also throw in Rudy Perpich, a Democrat. So we got a Republican, an Independent, and a Democrat. Rudy Perpich was not afraid of the teachers' union. He actually was in the forefront of the country when it came to innovation and creativity with respect to education, school choice, charter schools. We led the nation in those areas. People look to us from all over the country. That hasn't been the case for 20 years. Nobody looks to us anymore in education. So I would give you that combination. Thanks, Jeff. Representative Matt Dean, and you are allowed to use any of the governors that uh, have been used by previous candidates. <laughs> Who is the best Minnesota governor? What was his best accomplishment? Well, I, I hope that the best governor is going to be the next governor. And that's the, what I'm really working on. I can tell you that much right now. And uh, lots of Minnesotans agree with me that we are due for a change. And we are due for some leadership. I can tell you I was very lucky to work with Governor Pawlenty. Uh, because Governor Pawlenty, I learned something from him that is very, very important. When we were, work, we were deep, deep in the minority, there was 47 or 49, I can't remember which year it was, but we were very deep into the minority. There was, Democrats ruled you know, the legislature, but we Republicans stuck together and we tried to get some things that we could accomplish. And he said, work really hard, you know, fight, 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 never give up fighting. And we fought really hard and we got some things, even in our tiny minority, we were able to get some things done. And then Governor Polanyi said, we got it, we got it in the bills. I said, I'm not signing it unless I can get half of the conservatives to vote for this. So we pushed it really hard and we got some really good concessions. But then he did and he said something that was very, very important. He said, Matt, you guys did a great job. You fought really hard. It's time to take your jerseys off and it's time to get the bills put together. He said, I, we gotta put on our Minnesota jerseys next. And I understood that we had to get bills done that actually moved the state forward. When we did that, I think people appreciated it. Now, we never get done, we just continue the fight, and we need to stop it. Matt? Keith Downey, who is the best Minnesota governor? What was his best accomplishment? Well, I uh, actually agree with many of uh, Matt's comments about Governor Pawlenty, who I too served with. Uh, but honestly, I think the best governor for the state of Minnesota is Scott Walker next door in, Minna, in Wisconsin. He has opened everybody's eyes in this state to the fact that if you say what you mean and you do what you say, the people will stick with you no matter what. He has taught the people of Minnesota that you actually can cut spending, you can cut taxes, you can grow your economy, and here we sit in Minnesota with no venture capital investment, Foxconn opening up a plant for 10,000 new jobs. 
We've gone from 27 to 17 corporate head Fortune 500 headquarters here. Scott Walker has shown us right next door that you can take a, a Rust Belt type economy with conservative principles. You can reinvigorate the economy, and the people will believe in you, and they will trust in you, and they will buy in. And that is the model for us going forward here in Minnesota. Thank you, Keith Downey. Senator Dave Osmek, who was the best Minnesota or Wisconsin governor? What was his best accomplishment? What about Iowa and uh, North Dakota and South Dakota? No, they don't count. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have to say that I haven't, I don't think one in the last 50 years has been what I would term as best. Uh, I really think that there are good aspects from Governor Palente. He had a very much a fighter mentality that I think we all can appreciate. He also made some mistakes, and the biomass mandate was a massive mistake. Uh, and going back even further, Governor Anderson, Governor Wendell Anderson, back in the back in the 70s, had a good idea, and that's part of the problem of going to St. Paul. Is there's so many good ideas that start in St. Paul, that then are turned upside down and sideways. And he had this thing called helping. Uh, he, he helped. It was the Minnesota miracle, helping outstate Minnesota, which was local government aid, which has now been bastardized by Minneapolis and St. Paul because they keep getting more and more and more local government aid, and look what they're doing with it. They're not training their police force. So you really have to look at some of the, what some of the governors did. Governor Ventura had that libertarian streak. I agree with some of the comments that were made here. He had a libertarian streak where he was not going to just put up with the BS that was put in front of him. And I think I sort of espoused to some of that, too. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, Philip Parrish, who was the best Minnesota governor? What was his best accomplishment? This is a great question, and I don't have one. I've been looking for a long time. I've been involved with uh, grassroots politics for, since I was 14 years old on a Steve Swiggum campaign. And I honestly cannot tell you that I have a favorite uh, governor because I've been looking for an ideal that maybe I haven't been looking in the wrong place. And that ideal governor is that governor that's out there telling the truth. He's talking to people. She's talking to people. We are out there communicating about the truth on the ground, what's really going on with hardworking Americans, hardworking Minnesotans. And then going back to the legislature and, and actually participating with the legislator in making some really good decisions for Minnesotans. I want to see that governor that's stepping back and saying, you know what, the political interests and the backroom deals are not appropriate. And I'm going to stand up there and I'm going to tell you all, hey, this is going on and it's not right and you need to know the truth. That's the governor I've been looking for. So there's a governor out there. There's a governor that I've been aspiring to and looking for for a long time. And I haven't found him or her yet. And I'm hoping one day we do real soon. Thank you. Christopher Chamberlain. Uh who was the best Minnesota governor? What was his best accomplishment? Okay, I can't name a specific single one. Uh, my hero governor is Greg Abbott from Texas. Um, that man is a wonderful constitutionalist. He stands by the people. Um, I believe the governor who I would support the most and uh, believe in the most is the one who does not combine budget with bill. Keep them separate. They're two separate issues. They don't belong on the same palette. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey Wharton. Who was the best Minnesota governor? What was his best accomplishment? Well, as the uh, potentially the youngest one up here, as you can tell, I haven't uh, had much time to gather that much info. But for the ones I do remember, um, probably go back to as far as Jesse Ventura. That's about it. <laughs> But I'd have to say Jesse Ventura. He w was a strong body. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind. So, yeah, he was the body. But you know, he was he was an inspiration. He's always you know been an inspiration to me as far as not being afraid to you know stand out and stand up. So that I would definitely go with Jesse Ventura. All right, you are uh, unfortunately all wrong. The correct answer was Harold Stassen. It was Governor Harold Stassen. It was Harold Stassen. Harold Stassen. So, if you're no points awarded to any of you. you. If anybody here is related to Harold Stassen, please raise your hand and sit on the floor. Oh, there you are. 
All right, uh, this is the last uh, long form question, and uh, Jeff, Jeffrey, we'll start with you. Briefly describe the worst billion dollars current state government is spending. Just one? <laughs> I, I, again, this is a, a from from what I've gathered, there's definitely more than once. So, <laughs> you know, bad situations. Um, I really can't budget down to one because, uh, again, my expertise in the politi you know political field is very slim. But again, that's um, something I will educate myself. You know, keep continuously doing my homework as I have been. Um, so yeah, but you know, to reiterate my original, my first. You know, the kicker to that question is, yeah, I really don't think you can barrel it down to one. There's been too many mistakes made, so. Wasn't Harold Stassen 30 when he was elected governor? Yeah. 30. Yeah. yeah. 31. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Uh, next. How old Sorry. are you, Jack? Uh, <laughs> shut up. Uh, Christopher Chamberlain, uh, briefly describe the worst billion dollars current state government uh, is spending. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I can't go with one. I'll have to go with two. Met Council, LEGA. LGA is a disaster. It's being allocated in the wrong ways. And Met Council, we're wasting our money. Get rid of it. Thank you, Philip Parrish. Briefly describe the worst billion dollars currently uh, that state government is spending. Oh, I don't think it's just a billion. I think it's a lot more. But the inappropriate fights with the mining industries and Lori Swanson and her crew out of bounds and way beyond her scope. And then gave up the governorship to join the Navy? Yep, right. To go fight in a who Yeah, Stassen. Name yes. a politician who'd do that. Yep. Yeah. All right, Dave Osmek, uh, briefly describe the worst billion dollars currently being spent by state government. Well, I'm not going to pander to the media, but we have a $90 million elephant that's across the street from the Capitol called the Senate Office Building. $90 million. Well, you want billions? I yeah, got, I'd have yeah, to go you've got $910 yeah, million to go. Get a list. <laughs> Well, let's see. Southwest Light Rail would be two billion. Does that get me across now this you, Now you're over the right. limit. Uh, this is like this is like uh, the Price is Right, isn't it? Uh -huh. uh, but the worst one, I think, is that ninety million dollar elephant that's sitting across. We did not need that thing. We had plenty of room in the Capitol. We didn't have to burn. And that's the worst constructive building in the entire state. You can go into Senator Pratt's office, take a ball, take a golf ball, drop it on the floor, and read the break and his floor because it is settling and now he has a slope to his office. Uh, we have walls Does that are Does it lean to the out. left or right? It, it leans straight towards the Capitol, where everything seems to go. So but left. you know, it, it really is insane how we built, we also built it with no staircase that goes all the way from the top of to the bottom. You get to have one staircase, then go around the corner, then go up another staircase, and go around the corner. It's the biggest waste and boondoggle of all time, other than Southwest or Botno or any other other lines that we, we have going on. But we didn't need that building. We should be getting rid of it. Thank you, Senator Osma. Keith Downey, uh, the worst billion dollar state government is spending. I thought you were going to talk about the gold plated uh, washroom in your office building, Dave, but. No, 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 no. No, actually, uh, I think the front runner by far is the billion dollars that we just threw into bailing out Minsher. Um, for those of you who don't know, the federal government, about three, four, five years ago, I don't know exactly when, refused to allow the Obama administration to do a back-end bailout. You might remember Marco Rubio took credit for it in the last presidential campaign, and Republicans held the line on that back-end bailout of Obamacare nationally, and guess what? Everybody saw that thing for what it was, its structural unsoundness and the fact that it didn't work. And so here we in Minnesota to the lauds of the New York Times and the Star Tribune just through a huge back-end bailout. We're calling it reinsurance, but bottom line, the taxpayers in this room are going to pay the highest out-of-pocket claims, and the state is basically bailing out Minsure once again. And not only is that horrible policy, because that plan is still crippling people and the costs are too high, but it's horrible politics. We now own what happens with Minsure. This, this provision was a debacle beyond comprehension when you really think about it. So we have a huge problem right now with what's happening in Obamacare. We made it worse as Republicans, and we're going to have to find a way to come back, to scratch and claw our way back uh, from that huge hole when I get in there, and we will. All right, thank you, Keith. Matt, worst billion dollars being spent by state government. Well, it isn't health care, I can tell you that much right now. And right now, we pay 
the, the legislative auditor looked into this and found that over a six month period, we spent $231 million for health care for people who live in other states, make too much money, or are dead. All right, just over six months. We spent $400 million on a broken website and we turned over the health care of many Minnesotans over to that that is completely unnecessary and is hurting people. So everybody says, I, I had a, a bill that says we're going to kill and bury Mincher. And people said, well, you can't do that. I mean, what are you going to replace it with? When you have something that is unnecessary, expensive, and hurts people, you get rid of it. And that's what you do. Now, in Minnesota, I talked to a gentleman here uh, at the health care forum. He's back here again today. I'm glad to see he's here. He's a guy who's working really hard, working hard to try to uh, pay for health insurance. Can't afford it. Goes, to the, goes and says, hey, I thought we were supposed to get some help. If we, if we need some help affording per private health insurance, what's going on? I can't afford it. You know what they told him? They said, maybe get divorced. Then we'll put you on another government program. How's that work for you? With the people who are working the hardest are getting the least, and it's not fair, and health care is worth, that is the biggest waste. Thank you, Matt. And Stassen was a Republican, right, Rachel? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, we just renamed this forum. All right, uh, uh, Commissioner Jeff Johnson, briefly describe the worst billion dollars currently being spent by state government. It's funny that you choose that number because the operating budget of the Met Council is $1 billion. And I, I get asked the question frequently, what is the very first thing you'll do after you're sworn in as governor? And my answer is I'm, I'm going to go find a private place to go with my wife to pray for some guidance and some humility, and then I'm going to go fire the Met Council and dismantle that beast once and for all. And, and the reason for that isn't necessarily that the Met Council is the biggest problem in government, it's because it's symbolic of the biggest problem in government, which is this belief that government knows best how we should spend our money and live our lives. Government knows best what our health insurance should look like and how much credit card debt we should carry and how we should commute to work and what we should eat and drink or how we should raise our kids. That will change when I'm governor of Minnesota because it's none of government's business and it's worth a fight. So I'd start with the Met Council. All right, thank you, Jeff Johnson. Now we're in the lightning round. Uh, you've got 10 seconds. You won't need 10 seconds. I think these are all yes, they are, yes or no questions. Start with you, Jeff, and move all the way down the line. Will you abide by the Republican Party's endorsement? Yes. Matt? Yep. Keith? Yes. Dave? Yes. Hello? Yes. Christopher? Yes. Jeffrey? Yes. Have you taken the No New Taxes Pledge? Have you taken the No New Taxes Pledge? Jeff? Jeff, free. Uh, no. Christopher. Most definitely, they sent me a beautiful package, and I plan on signing it. Awesome. Philip. They haven't contacted me yet, but I would pledge. All right. Dave Osmick. I have signed it four years in a row, and this will be my fifth year. I haven't gotten this document in yet, but I have signed it four years in a row. Keith Downey. I haven't received it either, but yes. Matt Dean. I have signed it in the past, have not yet received it. Jeff Johnson. Same. Uh, will you fund light rail? No. Matt? No. Keith? No. Dave? Hell no! <laughs> Philip? No. Christopher? Why not? Funnel it right into the garbage. Jeffrey? No. All right. Uh, closing statements. You can hang out of the mic. You were first. One minute clo closing statement. You can step up here to do it. Uh, one minute. The clock is being reset to say one minute. Go. Jeffrey Wharton. Closing statement. Hmm, let's see. You already know who I am, Jeff Wharton. Um, you know, in all fairness, I know I've been told that it's a far and few in between gap for me between where I'm standing and the front doors of that Capitol. And for me, uh, I'm dedicated because I believe, and I'm sure a lot of you believe, that anything is possible. I know my expertise in politics, government is very limited, but my expertise in life is well endowed, and with that, so funny. <laughs> but uh, with that, I look forward to uh, pushing through, and it's definitely something I'm going to do. I'm not going to quit. I look forward to seeing every one of you in the future, and God bless you. All right, thank you. That was Jeffrey Wharton. Now, Christopher Chamberlain, one-minute closing statement. 
All right, well, I am starting on the 19th of this month the Changing the Status Quo Tour. We are reaching cities starting in St. Cloud at the um, Coyote Moon. Then we're going over to the 400 Club. Then I'm heading down to Turtles and Shakopee. I've got uh, finishing off one is on October 19th at 7 in Minneapolis. We are setting up tour dates throughout Rochester, Hastings, uh, Moorhead, Duluth, all across Detroit Lakes. I want to see everyone across the state of Minnesota because you have the right to get your views heard. I don't want to tell you what I'm going to do. I want to hear what you want me to do. What do you want from a governor? What can we do to make your life easier? And how can we get out of your life? Thank you and God bless. Christopher Chamberlain, now Philip Parrish, uh, closing statement, one minute. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jennifer and the team here. Frank, you did an outstanding job, and all the team was helping you. Team Parish, wave at everybody. All right. Make sure you check out the website. Um, I, get, I have a lot of respect for everyone up here, and in this party of opportunity that we have, I would love to see everyone get more and more involved, get out there talking to people, have a conversation with someone. Even in that subject that's a little bit tough, a little bit hard to get through, just sit down. Calm it down, take a deep breath, and get through that conversation. We've got some really serious business to tend to, and we can do this. So get out there, have a conversation, reach out to us, let us come visit with you, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Senator Dave Osmek, one minute closing statement. Well, thank you, and thank you, for, thank you for being here today. We have a great crowd here. It's excellent to see all of you here. You are looking for a fighter. In Washington, D.C., we have a president that is not willing to stand for the status quo. You may not agree with everything he says, but you know that he believes in what he says. We need the same thing in the governor's mansion in Minnesota. I stood up this year. I lost a 200 to 1 vote. There was only one person who voted against a last-minute, dark-of-night amendment from Senator Ron Lance who had no idea what he was doing and no idea how far-reaching his legislation was to try and protect your Internet rights. Guess what? He wasn't protecting your rights. He was impinging upon your rights, in my opinion. And I stood up as the only legislator. And sometimes you need a governor that's willing to stand up even when everybody else is saying no to say yes or vice versa. So thank you for being here and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Closing statement, Keith Downey, one minute. Thank you. A woman came up, kind of made a beeline across the street at me this morning at the booth and she was talking to me about uh, her personal situation and what she was looking for from politicians and from government. And by the time we got done, she literally had tears welling up in her eyes and her request of me, her ask of me was, will you fight for us? Will you fight for us? We're out here and if you fight for us, we will be on your side. That is the essence of this election in 2018. I have always prided myself on having the plans to shrink government, to reinvigorate the economy, to get after the achievement gap, and all of the things that plague Minnesota right now that really are creating a failure to thrive situation. But as I think about this election and come out of this state fair, the single abiding thing for me is we have to fight for the average everyday person. The political class is not going to deliver these solutions. The entrenched cronies down in St. Paul aren't. It is we the people, Time. led by somebody on the Republican Republican side who's going to stand up and fight for him. All right, State Representative Matt Dean, one minute closing statement. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Minnesota GOP for really doing a great job with the fair this year. Chair Carnahan, especially, thank you. This has been a great fair. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today to share our views and to kick off the upcoming election. I think it's been a great first day for that. I, I can tell you that. I'm going to start tomorrow because 87 days from now we're going to be in Brainerd for the Central Committee for the Republican Party. In between now and then I will be at every county in the state of Minnesota at 87 counties in 87 days starting tomorrow morning in Ada. And this is going to be a campaign that is going to be grassroots, it is going to be fun, and it is going to win. If that sounds like fun to you, get on board right now today. Go to mattdeanforgovernor.org. We are going to take this across the state, and we are going to have so much fun because we have not outlawed it yet. Believe me, it, it, we haven't. But, we, but it, we might unless you get on right now. Come on and have some fun. Matt Dean for Governor. Check it out. Thanks, everybody.
Not hard to notice who wasn't thanked in that one. No questions for you, Matt. <laughs> Get a picture. For those listening at home. All right. Uh, Jeff Johnson, one minute closing statement. I want to thank... I want to thank Jack and Ben for the tremendous job that they did today. Nope. And all thank you. We know who the so winner appreciate is. Appreciate that. Thanks. Wait, you got to reset my time. That's not fair at all. <laughs> thank you. So I think the most important job of our candidate for governor is not to raise money or travel the state. It's to share a vision of where you want Minnesota to be with the people of Minnesota. So here's mine. I have a vision of a state where patients control their own health care and farmers control their own land and entrepreneurs control their own businesses and where that single mom from Minneapolis who just wants her little boy to go to a safe, decent school actually has the power to do it because we've given it to her. It's a state where the American dream is alive and well because every Minnesotan who's willing to work really hard can find a meaningful middle class job that allows them to provide for their family. And it's a state where we have ended this bitterness and envy over income differences and this belief that the poor are poor and the rich are rich and all you can do is redistribute the wealth and instead we are preaching every single day a gospel that the poor can become the middle class and the middle class can become rich and anyone who starts with nothing can still achieve anything in this state. That's my vision. It should be our mission and if it is, we'll win in 2018. Thank you all. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you to all the candidates who came to the Republican Party's inaugural Harold Stassen Gubernatorial Forum. <laughs> Family members, of course, and members of the legitimate media. If you'd like some clean audio of this, go to oppenadamshow.com. It'll be there. And uh, if you'd like to ask the candidates questions, uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm out of here. Thank you. All right. I need to do a couple of things. One, uh, the Republican Party reminds you that uh, Bob Carney is also a candidate for governor for Minneapolis. Uh, if you want to see any of this forum or all of the other forums held at the Minnesota uh, Republican Party's fair booth, you can go to youtube.com slash northstaroasis. All of the forums, including this one, will be there on video. And uh, you'll be able to hear this episode of Up and Adam uh, with the Republican Forum on Wednesday morning at upandadamshow.com. Up and Adam.